API docs with OpenAPI 3.0. Um, first thing we should start with is by, with the definitions, of course. And so what is an API and what is a web API? Some of you may already be familiar with, with these acronyms. Uh, API basically is software that communicates with other software through an interface. And unlike the user interface that, that you use, for instance, for you know, to create a PowerPoint presentation, which is visual, APIs usually involve, uh, involve coding. A web API is just a type of API. Uh, those endpoints are, are available on the web. There's, there's lots of web APIs. It's like the most popular type nowadays. Um, programmable web as a directory where you can browse them. There's more than 22,000 listed, 23,000 uh, at the time I wrote this. Um, there's probably even more. There's lots of private APIs too. And chances are that you're going to document a web API in the future. So here's an example. This You'll see the, um, okay, this is the animated GIF. So I'll have to, let me just switch here to presentation mode. So as you see here, the, uh, this is the AccuWeather API. I just entered the API key, sent a request with a value, and I got some data in JSON format. So let's let's see the animation again so that you, there you go. So I entered the API key, and then you can see the resource URL here. I just put the country code. And this is like a very basic request to get all the communities that are part of a country. This is basic, this is like very basic, way of work for a web API. You send some basic information, some parameters, and you get data, uh, structured data that you can you can parse and you can process. Uh, let me see, I have lost to Google Chrome here. There you go, I can see you again. Uh, Nina, can you hear me? There was some issues. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. Uh, OK, perfect. Let's, let's go ahead then. So when we, when we talk about web APIs, there's several standards, several architecture styles to implement them. Uh, this is from the SmartBear State of the API um, document for, from last year. SmartBear is a company that deals with API and, and testing software. Uh, they are also the, uh, the main authors of the OpenAPI specification. Uh, so they have a big stake there, of course. And, and this chart is from a survey they ran last year. And as you can see, REST is, and we're going to see in a minute what that is, REST is by far the most popular architectural style for, um, for web APIs out there, followed by SOAP, which is um, an XML-based technology uh, which predates open API. It's, there's still lots of companies that, that, that use it. And then we have other standards such as XML RPC. Uh, it's also still kicking. And GraphQL is slowly growing. It's becoming more popular too. But right now, if, if we talk about web APIs, chances are that there are REST. REST is, is not, a, so it's, it's not a, um, a specification. It's more like a style of, uh, of, of communication for software. Where, where you have services that manipulate and access resources by using a uniform, idempotent, predefined set of stateless operations. So let, let me define all this. So you have a client here, picture with the computer, and we run this query, get accounts. Get here is one of those uh, stateless operations. And we say stateless because um, the server which is here, uh, doesn't know nothing about all the session or, or what you're trying to achieve. It's just going to handle the single request. That is very useful when you have scenarios where, um, for instance, you have bad connectivity or you cannot keep alive a connection for a long time. So it's, it's a pretty resilient style of communication where you, you just send an operation to the server and if that operation gets to the server, perfect. You execute it, you, you do things, and maybe you return data as JSON or XML typically. But if, if that doesn't reach the server, then 
no harm is done. Uh, what about if the same request reaches the server several times? Well, that's why we talk about idempotent, which is a, is a tenet of, uh, of the REST architectural style. Idempotent basically means, and I'm simplifying a lot here for the sake of, of this presentation, that no matter how many requests you're going to send, the server will always execute the same operation on the same resource. So that also prevents uh, overrides and, and weird behaviors when a message is, is duplicated or sent several times over the same connection. Um, let's go now to resources. When we talk about resources in, in, uh, in REST architectural styles, so resources are basically can be anything. Can be, oh, there you go, there's a typo here. Let's, let's just correct it, technical writer style. Resources are objects uh, made of data, typically, that you can manipulate using the API. But the important thing to note here is that they can be attributes, they can be uh, data, but they cannot be, or at least they advise that they are not actions. They shouldn't be things you do with the data, because for that, you already have the, uh, the operations, the HTTP verbs, which are, you're going to see in a second. So here's a couple examples. The first example is, is good rest. So you do a post operation against the pictures resource, and you have an ID, so pictures one, and you're sending or creating, in this case, the metadata of picture one. But if you do something like post pictures one delete, in this case, what is delete? Is it a resource? Not really. It's an action. It's something that we are doing on the data. So rather than have this, you should have something like delete, which is an existing HTTP verb, slash pictures, slash one. This is the proper REST way of doing it. Uh, more things to take into account about resources is that they have identifiers. So in this case, it's the number here, so that you can tell which resources is which. Resources which. And that's why also most REST API you'll encounter have pluralized use pluralized nouns for the resources, like pictures, instead of picture. Uh, resources usually have a data model associated with them. So in pictures, uh, you would have the file name at the very least, the media type, uh, et cetera. Uh, one important thing about resources is that it's one of those areas of REST API design where technical writers have lots to say uh, about things like resource naming, um, like the styling, for instance, like uh, you know, using camel case, snake case, etc. Et and um, I'll, I'll I'll wrap about this several more times during this session. Um, but keep in mind that um, yeah, in this in this slide. But we're, let, let's go now to the HTTP verbs first. So uh, we have resources, and then we have the actions that we execute those resources. And for that, the HTTP protocol is pretty fitting. Um, it's interesting because the HTTP protocol was created before the REST architectural style was defined, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but the HTTP verbs provide exactly what REST needs in terms of, uh, in terms of those uniform set of operations you run on the data. Um, these are just, this is like, consensus that, that's been, you know, been built up over the years. Uh, but there's no, there's no official way, there's no official REST uh, guidelines out there. It's every company decides how to implement these operations for, say, retrieving data or updating or deleting resources. Um, whenever you're, you're starting to document a new uh, a new REST API. It's important that you align with the engineering team on what these verbs do on the resources, depending also on which resources we are talking about. So here is the slide that I wanted to show you before: is that uh, we talk about a lot about uh, documenting web APIs, but uh, in my opinion, also based on my experience. Um, when you do API documentation, you're also doing API design, especially when dealing with Open API 3.0. So, unless they tell you to, you know, to just stick to documentation, um, but I, I don't believe that that could happen. Really, is I, I advise that that you get involved with API design from the very beginning. 
And API design here means not just the technical bits. For that, you can count on, on engineers and architects to help you with that. But is, is especially uh, about all the text that goes with the, with the REST API design, because in the end, it's, it's an interface. It's a text-based interface, uh, highly structured, highly standardized that other software is going to use and other software developers are going to use to interact with your data. And this, the kind of stuff that a writer can uh, you know, have an opinion and, and can uh, influence uh, when it comes to REST API designs goes from naming conventions for the API resources to uh, the style guide for the example, the summaries, even the error codes uh, are, are a good example of text that a technical writer can standardize. So inevitably, especially when you use OpenAPI 3.0, which acts as a contract, inevitably you'll be involved in some, in some capacity uh, in, in API design. You probably have read about RESTful uh, somewhere. So when we say RESTful APIs, it's like a more correct way of referring to REST Web APIs because there's no web API that we can consider fully REST. Uh, what we can say is that APIs are RESTful to some degree. So they implement um, more or less of the REST principles. And we have several levels. Uh, these are from uh, a blog post linked here at the bottom by Damien Fremont. Um, at level zero, we have APIs, web APIs like SOAP APIs, where you have an endpoint like this that says, retrieve all shiny pink resources, thanks, or, or something along those lines. And what do you notice about this? Well, you notice that the resources, the action, the attributes, everything is mixed. So what happens here is that HTTP is just used as a tunnel. There's, there's no resting place. There's no resources. There's no uniform actions applied on those resources. At level one, you do get resources, but it's still very primitive because you could use any HTTP operation to do stuff on this resource with the same result. Most web APIs I've seen out there uh, are level two. So they're, they use HTTP verbs on resources to achieve things in a predictable way. Then things eventually get more complicated. And then it really depends on uh, the level of maturity of, of engineering at, at the company you're working at. Uh, so at level three, you get hypermedia controls that allow you um, discoverability so that you get a resource. And along with the data, you get links to do more stuff with that resource. Um, at level four, there's versioning information. Um, that, that comes with the, with the API responses, and then behaviors, which we're going to see afterwards, uh, that are somehow implemented also in OpenAPI 3.0, but it's, it's a bit more complicated. For now, let's just stick with level two to three uh, RESTful APIs, which are the most common. So we already mentioned OpenAPI. Uh, what is OpenAPI, really? It's just a, a language agnostic way of, of describing and, and documenting RESTful web APIs. And this is an official picture from, from the OpenAPI website um, made by, by SmartBear. And you see that OpenAPI as a contract allow you to um, have meaningful discussions and collaborative work across the whole life cycle of a web API. So you start with typically with designing, say, the, uh, the structure of the API, you can use then the file to mock APIs so that you can test them. You can generate server code and client code from the specification, which is incredibly useful uh, to save time at the beginning. You can use the open API specification, which is, again is, acts as a contract for things like testing, security testing. And of course, you can also use it for, uh, for documentation. And we are going to see how in a minute. Why open API specifically? Well, it happens to be uh, a very versatile, very simple way of, of describing APIs. And this, again, is from the SmartBear State of the API survey from last year. And it's, it's quickly become the most popular way of, uh, of designing and documenting uh, REST APIs. Above, for instance, WSDL, which is associated with, with SOAP technology, typically. Uh, other standards, such as you may have heard about RAML, and Blueprint, which have very useful features. But Rumble in particular uh, 
Uh, last year, I think they, um, it's from MuleSoft, they said that they're gonna merge, uh, they're gonna give up developing RAML and they're gonna merge uh, all the features and join effort with the OpenAPI uh, group. So that probably OpenAPI 4.0 will have some features from RAML, uh, such as multiple definition files. So also the, the reason why we are here is because API reference documentation, which is something that OpenAPI allows, is one of the most important things that developers are gonna look for um, when, when they're gonna use a web API. And documentation is, is a key part of the developer experience there. What they are looking for is stuff that you can actually provide directly in OpenAPI, such as examples, uh, status and error codes, authentication information, parameters, uh, methods, all these can be added, like the top five items can all be added directly in OpenAPI. There's other things which are non-reference documentation, like getting started or tutorials, uh, which are like the, the, um, the second bit of documentation you would typically develop. But everything starts with API reference documentation and almost always that means editing open API files. Oh, sorry. Do, do, do. Uh, there's several solutions out there. Here I just, there will be links at, at, the, at the end, but uh, and I'll also send the, the slide deck by the way. So no need to copy them down right now. There's several solutions that allow to generate reference documentation from an open API file without having to uh, writing any code. These are the most popular. The first three, Swagger UI, Redoc, and Wither Chains are open source. Um, this is by far the most popular, but it's also very, it's like too popular. You probably have seen this style too much out there. Um, currently, I think Redoc is, is the most popular among open source solutions. And then you have Software as a service solution such as Redmi or Stoplight Docs, which is great, um, that also let you create the non-reference documentation bits. So you, you pay like a small fee, uh, small monthly fee or yearly fee, and, and you get a platform where you can uh, host or create and then download uh, all your web API documentation. So before we dive into open API, um, are there any questions? Can you can use the hand button to, to raise your hand if you have any question. No, since we are good. Um, do you still hear me? Audio is fine. Shanice, you raise your hand. Okay, so this chop your times. Okay, if if um, if you fail to hear something I'm saying, I'm, I'm gonna go a bit slower. Uh, simply let me know directly here in the chat. So I, I picked Jitsi over Zoom out of security concerns because it's an open source platform. Um, but if there's any issue with the sound, just just let me know. So let's let's dive into Open API. Right, it's so exciting. Um, the promise is big there, and the promise is a single way of documenting and designing REST web APIs uh, that anyone can use, including technical writers. So first of all, on the right side, you can see like a, an excerpt of a typical open API file in YAML format. Open API files are um, a specification, API specifications in written as plain text. Uh, and typically they are either in JSON or YAML format, both are structure test formats for describing data structure using plain text. Uh, so it's just a convention for, for writing structure text. Um, they are simpler than XML in that you don't have to uh, worry too much about tags and, and other uh, complicated nested structures. Um, that also comes with these advantages, but the main advantage that I would say is that they're much simpler to, uh, to edit. They can use any text editor to edit them. Uh, I recommend Visual Studio Code and, and there's some links at the end of this presentation uh, 
with some useful extensions. Um, OpenAPI 3 supports common mark, which is a flavor of markdown for the description fields, which is great because um, you can basically write like small documentation paragraph with proper formatting uh, directly in OpenAPI files. Um, here is the link to the official specification, which is also hosted on GitHub. Uh, the specification is a little dry as a document, uh, so I recommend that you use other resources that, that I'll provide you at the end of the presentation for learning about OpenAPI. But if you have any doubt, the specification is really the place to go to, uh, you know, to sort out any doubt. This is a big question. Should I use JSON or YAML for, for OpenAPI docs? Well, my, my, my preference is for YAML, and it's also the preference expressed by uh, SmartBear, who are the creators of uh, Swagger Hub and Swagger UI, um, mainly because of readability. It's so much simpler for technical writers to read and edit a YAML document compared to the hell of curly braces uh, that you get with JSON. The inconvenient with YAML is that you have very, very careful, you have to be very careful with indentation YAML is a child of the Python ecosystem, which is also very uh, strict about the use of indentation for code. So if you get, these are all two spaces levels. And if you get a two space indentation wrong, sometimes the, uh, that, that'll break your open API specification. So you gotta be careful there. Uh, the basics of YAML, well, it's, you'll see that it's pretty easy to master. Um, I really do recommend these, this website down here. I'm a fan of LearnX in Y minutes. And you, you basically get like a breakdown of the whole YAML standard and on a single page, which you can read like in 10 minutes. Um, the, the essential is you use two spaces to, to indent uh, objects at different levels. You don't need quotes nor braces, which is great for writers. You use hyphens for a race like this. Uh, our sequence, item one, item two. And um, you can nest pretty much uh, all items. Again, provided that you respect and follow the two spacing dent. Uh, both uh, Swagger Hub and Visual Studio Code with, with proper uh, plugins um, have linters for YAML. A linter is basically a checker for, uh, for code formatting. Uh, that really helps because if, if you, if you type YAML in, uh, in an editor that supports YAML linting, you will very quickly notice if there's any issue with the YAML file. Whereas if you do it, say, in, in Notepad, <laughs> I, I strongly advise against using uh, anything other than a code editor for, for editing open API specifications. Uh, if you use a, a, a plain text editor without plugins or without linting, you won't know till you try generating stuff out of the open API specification. Another big question is, so there's, there's a bit of confusion about Swagger and OpenAPI. You, you probably have heard about Swagger a lot, uh, especially Swagger 2. And then there's OpenAPI. So what's the difference? Well, they're essentially the same. It's part of the same family. Uh, OpenAPI 3.0 came a few years ago as a, as a new version of Swagger 2. Um, I would say the name is also much clearer now. Um, Swagger 2 is still very popular. Um, I would say the majority of, of web APIs out there still use Swagger 2 because that's, it's been around for more than 10 years now. But more and more uh, developers and, and uh, also designers are using OpenAPI C.0 because the structure and, and the objects that, that OpenAPI 3 provides are uh, much simpler and much more powerful than, than what Swagger 2 provides. So this is a difference. You have an, a link down here, which highlights what are the difference between the two standards. Um, but basically what you see is that OpenAPI 3 um, groups lots of optional stuff into the into reusable component section that you can reference from all the other levels. We're going to see this structure in a minute. But basically, the, the, the takeaway message here is that you should use OpenAPI 3, not Swagger 2, for uh, open API design. It's worth noting that you can convert back and forth between Swagger 2 and Open API 3. So it's if you if you have a Swagger 2 definition, you want to update it to upgrade it to Open API 3, you can do this uh, at any, at any time. 
let's start with the with the with the main structure of open api so typically an open api documents opens with Imagine that these are all YAML lines with columns. So typically, uh, an open API definition specification, sorry, starts with an open API declaration that says, this is an open API document version 3.0. whatever. Uh, right now, I think we are at version 3.0.3. .3. That is followed by an info object that contains the metadata of, of the open API specification. Then you have uh, two optional objects here. One is servers. Um, servers is how you connect to the API. Paths is, well, all the mandatory objects are in red, sorry. Paths is like the center of the, of the specification. If you don't have a path object, you basically don't have a REST API because paths describes uh, the endpoints of your API. So if you don't have it, there's no way you can interact with it. Components is, again, as we've seen, is, is the container for all the reusable objects that, that you use across your open API definition. Then there's security information for um, using the API, like what sort of key do you need, et cetera. Tags is more for documentation purposes. And external docs is simply a link to, uh, say, the uh, no reference documentation. The X that you see here uh, is, is one nice thing about OpenAPI 3 is, um, is extensions. So you can expand or extend any OpenAPI specification using your own or third-party um, objects. For instance, AWS has as, um, as a bundle of, of their own uh, extensions for OpenAPI that they use for, for their own product, which is API Gateway. Um, but you can also define your own. For instance, I've seen examples of uh, extensions used for localization purposes, which is very interesting. But again, this is a standard that you have to define internally with the team. And if it makes sense, you also have to document very clearly uh, in your API documentation. This is the info object. It's one of the simplest. You have an example here. So you start with a title. Uh, notice that there's no um, there's no quotation marks. So you, you, in YAML, you simply can have a, uh, a string like this. You can be explicit if you want to to wrap this in in quotation marks. You can do it, but normally you don't need it. Then there's a description. You have the terms of service, contact information, which is optional. Uh, also license again optional, and then you have version, which by some software such as Swagger Hub used to is used for versioning the API. So this is made to data. Next is the servers object. Service again is optional, but um, if you if you do some automation, like if you if you create mock servers or you distribute your open API specification to clients so that they can connect and use your services, uh, service can be very useful for defining like where, where your API is based and where you can connect to it. Uh, notice the use of templating here. So username, port, and base path are all variables that you can then document here underneath. And notice also the usage of enum here for values, for the acceptable values for ports. Um, this would be translated, if, if you use software like, like Swagger, um, Swagger UI, this would be translated to, let, let's have a look at it. So for instance, let's go to have a look at this Wagger UI example here. So all that all that you've seen in the info object is here. So you have the title, you have the version, you have the description of the API, and then you have several links to license, et cetera, documentation, and so on. Um, the um, the uh, the server's information is what is it? Okay, so this is actually not in this example, but you would get something here, like a like a URL, and if you have defined parameters, you you would be able to replace them with any text you want. Let's get back to the presentation now. Yeah, security object is. Um, there's a handful of options for REST APIs currently when it comes to security. 
And that ranges from basic authentication to API keys, which is the, uh, the classic one. Uh, there's also compatibility with, with OAuth, the OAuth scopes, um, so open, open ID, et cetera. Um, this is a pretty, a rather dry part of the open API specification. Usually the engineering team will provide all the details you need here, um, but you can also comment this part or leave it out while you define the, the open API specification for testing purposes. So when you mock an API, you can leave this section out so that you can uh, create a mock server and, and test your API without having to introduce any, any fake key. Uh, if we go back to the example here, um, Swagger UI renders the security information as, as an authorized dialog. Uh, in this case, we have an API key in authentication. You would just put your token here and click authorize. We also have an OAuth2 example. Uh, this again is just the way that Swagger UI uh, renders the open API information, but there's other. For instance, if we look at Redoc, they just go with a slightly different approach and it's not interactive. Like you, you can't put your data, it's just documentation. Um, so then again, the information you put in your open API specification um, is really up to, the, to each piece of software. Um, the way it's, it's, you know, the way it's rendered, it up, it's up to the software. It's not up to the specification itself. This is also why some companies prefer to write their own software for generating code and documentation from open API specs, if you offer the, the resources for it. This again, uh, these are on the right side, you can, can see example of the you know, each authentication method. So basic auth, you would simply define it like this, like uh, type HTTP scheme basic, that's it. You don't need anything else. For AP, API key auth, um, you would add a parameter here, just, it just says that it goes into the HTTP call header and what is the name of the, of the parameter. And OAuth gets a little more complicated in that you have to uh, you know, break down the scopes. The tag objects is super quick to explain. Basically, you simply um, create tags that you can reuse across the, uh, across the path object, for instance, to group operations together. So in this case, let's go back to, to the Swagger UI example. <clears throat> Here you have a couple a couple tags. You have a, a tag called pet. You have another one store and you have another one, which is user. Uh, this is just for documentation purposes. It's not defining functionality, but it does have an effect on the documentation that you generate. So Andrea has a question. Some company prefer to develop the two themselves. So the reason for this is that um, if you stick with existing open source tools such as Redoc or Swagger UI, um, they might not fit your business case. Uh, so you have two options there. You either grab the source code of say Swagger UI, which you can do and you customize it, or you create your own solution that parses the, the open API specification file. Um, in most cases, you will want to start with with an existing solution just for, you know, for prototyping. But if you want something more complicated, like for instance, have a look at the Stripe docs here. If you want something customized, then you need your own, uh, your own developers to do it. I don't know if that answered the questions, Andrea. Perfect. No worries at all. Yeah, I think it's it's a good way. If you, if you type your questions directly in the chat box, I think it's the best way because uh, I can I can then uh, smoothly jump from uh, one question to to another. Um, so yeah, tax object again is just for documentation. Now path, um, the path object is is where you'll likely spend most of your time when uh, when defining an API, because as you can see here in this tree representation. Path is where, where you define the resource first. So this would be like imagine slash uh, pictures, for instance. 
And then you define here for, for each path, you define what it is, like summary and description. Uh, in the case of the path API slash path would be the path resource, right? It's, it's a path. And then, then you define everything that happens when you cross the HTTP verbs, the operations with the resource. So in this case, if you have get pets, is to retrieve a list of pets. Or you could have get pets slash ID, just to retrieve the details of one pet. Um, each operation then branches out to uh, a, a, a range of metadata, which is, uh, some of it is optional. But again, the blue bits are documentation. So these are the bits that you'll likely document first. Uh, among them is tags, which we have already seen, summary and description, external docs, if there's any link to, you know, that just describes the operation with the resource, and operation ID, which is, is arbitrary. It's decided usually by the team, by the development or the designer of the API. And it's used for, um, for some complicated actions that, that I show you later with, with links uh, and other stuff. Um, and then there's the mandatory bits, which are the request body, like what, what sort of information you're sending out, and responses. And this is really REST, is you send something, you send um, either parameters or a body or a payload, and you get something in return, which can be as simple as a 200 OK answer um, in, in HTTP format. Um, it's interesting that for each path action combination, you can override security and service information. So you could have a path uh, plus an HTTP operation that has its own security settings or its own server settings. Um, starting from OpenAPI 3, you can also mark, mark operations as deprecated. This is also documentation bit, but again, it's up to the software how to render this in the docs. So when we say parameters is basically is the information that you send out to uh, to the API to the web API interface so that something is done on the back end. And you can have several types of parameters. Path parameters usually looks like this. You have uh, say slash users and then you have a template for the ID. And this ID parameter is a path parameter because it goes into the path. If if you, you you can probably remember from the websites you use every day, some patterns like this in URLs. So, for instance, Jira. When you when you do a search in Jira, you can see some of the parameters are are in the path, like uh, say the the account. Um, and others can be in can be in the last bit of the URL, the one that comes up the question mark. This is what we call query parameters. Like when you do a search, typically you would have search, question mark, and then a number of parameters with equal sign uh, to define the value, uh, separated by ampersands, for instance, or commas. That really depends on the serialization style that we're going to see in a second. You can also send information uh, using the header, the HTTP header. Typically, it's authentication information, or it's, it's metadata that is not transparent for the user. Uh, but you can also define header parameters. And then there's cookie parameters, which, to be honest, I haven't seen examples of this in OpenAPI specifications. But you, you can also define parameters that go in, in cookies. Uh, some important things to take into account is that um, if a parameter is not marked as required, here you can have here, you see, required is one of those bits of documentation that you can, you can define. Then you can have you can't have um, you can have default values like if you know what what is the the default could be false could be zero in, the, in a parameter so you can define those um, you can use empty parameters you just need to add a key like this allow empty value um, in some cases this is more programmer jargon but you can also define nullable uh, parameters that you know that accept null as a value, so a known value. Uh, constant parameters are, are allowed to, and you can use enum, which we are going to see later, to, to define like a list of predefined values. 
Um, then you might wonder what happens if parameter is shared across operations. Well, you can define parameters at path um, at path level instead of the operation level. So instead of delete and then a parameter, you can define it at say slash pet level, and those are re-narrated by all the operations. For for each parameter section, you would have a name of the parameter and in as as the required values. And in again is what we have seen here that accepts values such as path, query, header, etc. We are going to see an example, a very simple example of Open API specification in a minute. So uh, don't worry about that. So parameter, what's the difference between empty and null? Uh, that's a very good one. And as a known developer, I constantly struggle a bit with this. So I think that empty is basically, there's nothing in, in the field, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and null is a bit different. Do we have a developer in the room? Miguel, are you there? Maybe you can explain. Or some developer. <laughs> I still struggle, to be honest. It's a really difficult question. Um, uh, sorry for this, you, you caught me off guard. Sure. Um, <laughs> could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, what is the difference between null and empty values? Uh, well, honestly, I'm. there are slight difference. I mean, empty, it's like an empty string. It's like there's text in there, but it's empty. It's like it starts and ends with uh, yeah. no character at all. Um, but it's still text. Exactly. No, it's just, uh, it's pretty much no value at all. For example, you you send a query parameter, uh, for example, in the Google search. And um, those uh, search parameters in GET requests uh, are usually app are appended to the URL. And uh, you can either not provide anything at all, and the search and the parameter just yeah. is just empty or doesn't even exist, yeah. basically. Or it's an empty string. It's like, Okay, it's empty. It's like it's yeah. text, but it's text with no content. Exactly. Yeah, an example uh, I've seen of this. The is parameter like, is there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I think the difference is whether you send or not the parameter. So if you're not yeah. sending the parameter at all, then you don't have any information, not even an empty string. Yeah. Right? Um exactly. Um oh right. sorry. Let's, uh, um, yeah, let, let's let's go ahead, but I think it's yeah. it's one of those interesting things um, yeah. uh, about developing a REST API. I will admit, though, that sometimes the characters are used interchangeably, um, or the terms are used interchangeably. Yeah. And sometimes we get things mixed up a lot. Yeah, that yeah. happens. And so, things, uh, yeah. sorry, the definition may change a little bit based on the language as well. Sorry, I just wanted to leave no, this thanks. out. Thank you. Thank you. Miguel. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you at all. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Um, so again, this is, an, you know, the whole null versus empty thing is a good example of uh, terminology issues that I recommend that you clarify with the team you're, you're, uh, you're developing the, the web API with. Um, let's have a look at the, uh, the open API specification for the pet store API, which is the, the example that we have in here. So let me, let me make this bigger. So here we have open API opening statement with the version number then the info object with the, you know, the usual metadata servers. And then we have paths. And this is what I wanted to show you. Um, first indentation level, we have a path, which is pets. This is the resource. And then you get the first action, which is get. And at get level, you have a summary, which says list all pets. This is documentation. You have an operation ID, list pets, tags. And this is the grouping that we've seen before. And then we have the parameters. And at the parameters, you have the name of the parameter, which is in this case is limit, where it goes. So that goes in the query bit of the URL, a description, whether it's required or not. And then you have the data type, which we're going to see now. But as you can see, everything that your API allows you, you know, operate to is defined at path, at path level. So let's go back now to the presentation. Parameter serialization, this is a rather dry way of saying uh, basically how you present the variables in, in your parameters. 
so for instance, for path, the default way is, uh, is using the simple style, which is this one. And for arrays, you would just use commas. For queries is the same thing. So you have a question mark followed by, uh, by an ID equal and then separated with ampersand. Uh, but there's many more other serialization styles that may fit your, your scenario better. And they are described here in the specification. So uh, this is just to say that you may see styles that diverge from, from, from the default ones. For data types, also this, we are not going to dig it too much into this. But just to clarify, OpenAPI allows you to, to describe lots of data scenarios. So for instance, for numbers, you can have several types of integers. Uh, you can set minimum and maximum as attributes, uh, whether there are multiple of something or not. Uh, you can have dates, passwords, uh, even emails, strings defined already. And all that is parsed and used by code generators and documentation generators um, to, to, to create the artifacts that they need for testing and designing the API. Enum, again, is, is quite useful. Very briefly, it's just a way of listing uh, the sort of values that you allow. And in this case, we have a parameter called sort that allows only ascending and descending as options, uh, nothing else. So if you generate an API from this code, um, it would only allow these two parameters for that, for these two options for that parameter. You have more complicated data structures too. Uh, again, this is an advanced topic, but um, if you heard about hash maps or dictionaries, um, it's important that you know that Swagger, you, uh, Swagger sorry, Open API 3.0 and Swagger 2 uh, allow for these type of data structures. This is a bit more complicated, and it's it's related basically with the JSON specification, which is the parent specification from which OpenAPI 3.0 was generated. And um, these keywords, one of, all of, any of, what they allow you to do is um, basically to 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 use inheritance properties, uh, inheritance mechanisms uh, across your OpenAPI specification. So for instance, uh, inheritance will be uh, unlocked by Olaf. And then you have also polymorphism, uh, which is applied by any of or one of. And on the example on the right side, you can see that like we have a schema. A schema is like a data description for the pet object. And the pet object has, has a property, which is the pet type. And this is like a very simple schema. But then dog which you have below here is a schema that extend the pet object. And it starts like this. It starts by saying, this schema contains everything from the pet schema plus a number of other properties. And in the example above, you can see here, well, I, I've kept this, but you see an example of a schema that you use one of to say, look, a pet can be one of a cat or one of, of a dog. Um, this is, I would say, use these, these keywords for, um, th these keywords simply make your life easier because you don't have to rewrite everything across the specification. And OpenAPI has a lot of mechanisms for content reuse that, that can really make your life easier. Because if you don't use these mechanisms, you can very easily end up with a YAML file that is 3,000 lines long or, or more. Uh, whereas if you use inheritance, polymorphisms, and also references, we, which we're going to see in a minute, um, your, your OpenAPI specification will be much terser and, and easier to scan. Media types, this again comes from the HTTP word, uh, but basically are declarations of the content that you have in responses or request bodies. Uh, they can have their own schema. So if, say, an operation returns XML and JSON or JSON, um, each type of media that you're returning as content can have its own parameters. When there are vendor-specific types, such as Excel, uh, you usually have the vendor PND prefix attached to it. And you can also use wildcards to say things like, um, image slash wildcard to say that 
um, an API accepts or returns an image, for instance. Request body is, is basically what you send uh, alongside the parameters. Parameters are very short. Uh, they are good for things like um, you know, retrieving certain items or um, running a search query. But if you need something more complicated than that, like uploading um, a pet profile, say, uh, then you need to send a body. And a body is simply a data structure with, with a number of, of variables or parameters um, that you define at content level. So in this case, we have uh, paths, pets. Then we have defined a post operation, which is to create a new pet. And the request body, which is required as content that could be either JSON or XML or even just text plain. If it's JSON, what we are saying here for the sake of simplification is that it can be one of one of these schemas. Can be one, it could be a cat, it could be a dog, or it could be a hamster. And this is a very common way of, of defining um, schemas at a path level because simply because you're not repeating everything. So you're just referencing a reusable uh, schema under components, which we're gonna see in also very soon. Um, again, it's optional by default, but um, chances are that if you are dealing with a complex API, uh, you're going to send out a body at, at some point. Uh, the request body also accepts form content. So if you have a web form like, say, um, the one here in, in the first picture with input name, fab number, and, and a button, and you can replicate that structure using application slash x3w form URL encoded. And in the schema, you simply recreate the properties of, of, of these complex objects. Um, you recreate the four fields as, as properties. So you have a name of type string, you have an integer for fab number, and you can say which ones are required. But the, the, the trick here is to use um, a media type that OpenAPI can interpret as, as a form. Then, of course, if you send a request, you'll get a response. And that is the other mandatory bit of a path object uh, in OpenAPI. There's some hard requirements here. So each operation must have at least one response, which could be something like uh, here, up here, you can see response 200. These are all HTTP codes. If you search in Google for HTTP codes, you'll get um, a list, which is actually uh, an RFC, an RFC standard uh, that all um, all software doing HTTP communication must adhere to, including browsers. So 200 is, is like the typical positive response to a request, and if everything goes okay, then you may or may not get um, some content as as a reply. You might just you know you might just get a description okay bit in this. Example on the right side, we do get an adjacent um, adjacent object in return, which has a schema, which is in this case is, is user. But you can also have error responses, such as 401 or the very famous 404. And, and here again, we see an example of a good practice, which is to reference uh, reusable responses um, into components. So you don't have to rewrite the schema for, for these errors across the whole API. Um, there's a nice trick here, which is the use of default. So instead of say that you want to cover all errors, you don't want to put all possible HTTP errors, you can simply write here default. So if there's, if, if the response you get from, from the server is not one of the you described here, it will default to that one. And, uh, that's, that's super helpful to cover the edge cases that your engineering team hasn't defined. There's more complicated mechanisms. Um, so before we mentioned the operation ID and we didn't know what was it for, but here we have an example and this is exclusive to OpenAPI 3.0. Uh, links are, are one of those restful level three, four uh, things that, that allow you to create APIs that are self-documented. By self-documented, we mean something like this. So we get a response here we created something, so we get a 201 code. And 
the resulting JSON has um, the, the reply from the server contains an ID of the object we just created. In this case, it's an user. But alongside the content and, and the ID that says you created user number three, we also get um, a link. And the link uses the following information. It uses the operation ID of the operation we are linking. So in this case, it's get the user details. Here it is. And as a parameter, it accepts, and this is um, an example of internal link, it takes the, the ID returned in the response body. The end result in, in a JSON payload would be uh, an HTTP link with the ID of the user you just created, so that if you instruct your, your software to follow that link, you can automatically get the user details without even having to, to build a, a, a custom query. Links are very powerful, and uh, you really have to understand how the API should behave in order to make the most out of them. Then there's callbacks, which is a very exotic thing, but it's mostly used for, for subscription mechanisms. Um, it, it works in a similar way than to links. Um, we are going to dig into this. It's, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an edge case, and it's not very well documented either in the official documentation. But just for you to know that if your software or API uses webhooks or, or has some sort of communication with the user, say that there's an operation in progress and you want to relay a message to the user, then you can define the callbacks for, for a resource once you have created it. So in, in this example, say that you have, um, you have started um, an, a mailing job. You get a 200 as a response, so it says OK. But the, uh, the, uh, the operation is in progress, so you don't, you don't get like a status report immediately. Well, in this case, if the server wants to update the user, it will follow these instructions here and use this, this request body, this schema, to get back to the user with, with information. And here we are back to documentation, which is examples. Um, examples, again, are part of the reference documentations. And you can add them to several items. You can add them to parameters. You can add them to properties and also to, to the objects you are describing in, say, um, um, responses. Um, they're very useful for API testing. So if, if you enter them in an open API specification, for instance, and you go to, uh, then you render that documentation in, in Swagger UI, uh, you will get the examples already available there for testing. It's not the same thing as default values. So it's important that you don't um, mistake examples with default values. Uh, default values will also be used by the client or server code that you generate, whereas example is just for documentation purposes. Um, runtime expressions, this is just for reference. It's uh, important that, that you know them a little bit. But it's basically is, is um, facilities to link to other parts of your specification from within the specification. So um, we have seen, for instance, response body uh, before with the link. Uh, this is a shorthand for the entire response body you get with uh, um, with, a, with a particular response from the server. Um, you can use these ingredients to, again, simplify and um, shorten your definition, your specification of a web API. Ref is super important. We have seen it already several times. Uh, Ref keywords is, is what you basically is, is a way of calling other components. So when then it's when we say that a YAML definition is resolved, then all these components are expanded to the actual data. So in this case, if we have a response 200 and we have a component called user here that lists a number of properties, but if we don't want to rewrite those under each 200 response, we can simply say that it's, um, we can simply reference the user schema that is under component. And that's it. It's just one line as a link to say, uh, I'm going to return a user. 
that's it. Um, the several style of refs. So this is the most common, this is the internal one that started with a hash character. Uh, you can also reference elements in other files and even uh, elements from other API specifications that are out there outside of your server. I haven't seen many examples of this, but if your API reuses objects from another API, you can also use this mechanism. The components objects, we, we talked a lot about it without digging into what it is and what it does, but um, the important bit here is that <coughs> it's basically a container of everything you're gonna reuse across your API specification. And one of the smartest things you can do uh, when documenting an API is to abstract everything that, that you think is gonna be repeated across the open API specification and put it into the components uh, container. Otherwise, you'll end up typing a lot. And, and believe me, you can end up repeating lots of parameters. And that is really, uh, it can really increase the chance of, of committing mistakes. Um, if you have to repeat like several hundred times the same error and you have to maintain or update that, um, you'll wish you had written that under components. Uh, there's several objects you can define under components to be reused. So you have parameters, of course, uh, like I, the user ID. You can reuse security schemes. You can reuse request bodies, responses, even examples. So pretty much, uh, pretty much of everything you can define under path, you can reuse. Um, so again, before approaching a new OpenAPI specification, design or documentation project, think about your, your reusability and your reuse strategy. Like, how are you gonna reuse all the objects across the API? Um, extensions, so we briefly mentioned at the beginning that you can extend um, your API with, uh, with, with vendor-specific extensions or your own extensions. And as I mentioned before, this is an example under security schemes of, of, uh, of an Amazon AWS API gateway um, authorization scheme. And we have a couple user, uh, a couple vendor extensions here for the API gateway. Um, if your specification is gonna be open to the public, which is likely, um, I advise you to check with your engineering team first if it's okay to share or to have these extensions in the specification. Uh, chances are that, especially for security schemes, chances are that you don't need this level of detail here. Um, quite on the contrary, it could be harmful. So it's okay to keep like a version, an internal version, just for implementation purposes that, that has these extensions. Uh, but ask your team if the extensions should be made public. Otherwise, you could get in trouble. Right, the very last bit. Well, first of all, before we go to the last part, which is the also the most rewarding, uh, any questions about, we've gone very fast through the Open API specification. Any questions about the Open API specification? Nope. No questions about OpenAPI? Well, um, I'll, uh, there's several resources that I link down there that will allow you to dig into the specification. And you'll need that for the exercise. So um, I, I hope that um, this overview that I provided will, will ring a bell once you do the exercise. So this is, I suggest that you print out this because this comes from Helen, who is a technical writer uh, at SmartBear. And we created together this list of most frequent mistakes that people uh, do when, when creating open API specifications. Uh, the first one is, especially when you use YAML, is not indenting properly. So this is the, by far is the most frequent. Like if, if something is not working with your open API specification, chances are that you haven't put enough spaces or you are nesting something in the wrong way. Typos are the second most common. So if you write something like path instead of you know, paths or um, you're not writing some, some of the basic keywords properly, uh, 
um, you won't get a, a, a valid open API specification. Take into account that names are case sensitive in YAML. So this is, I think I spent many an hour just trying to troubleshoot something that ended up being um, uh, an uppercase character that shouldn't have been there. Um, using the hyphen notation, the array when it's not needed, like writing lists is sometimes also causes some trouble when it's, you know, when, when you not, don't actually need an array. Uh, not escaping strings, like if you, if you add a column, uh, sorry, if you add a column in the description without wrapping it into quotation marks or if you don't escape it, escape it means doing something like this. Um, this may cause some issues because colon is like a very important character in YAML specification files. Um, again, if you forget about column slashes like in path objects or uh, when invoking components or, or doing ref links, uh, that may also be an issue. Um, and then here we have another other frequent mistakes that, that you can check later. Um, oh, thanks, thanks, Miguel, for clarification about uh, about empty and null. Um, so, in order to avoid issues with Open API specifications, I advise you to use validators. Um, one that is Common line base is is spec, specy, specy. I don't know how that's pronounced correctly. Specy, and um, you can download it and use it's it's free and it's great. It, it, it points out everything that may be wrong with with your Open API specification file. Um, you can use it like this: simply uh, specy lint Open API YAML. Then you have an Open API linter for Visual Studio Code. Here you have an example on the right side. I wrote. Open API 4.0, which doesn't exist, and Visual Studio Code, well, the, the, uh, the linter that I installed was quick enough to, to tell me Swagger only supports these versions. Why are you being so smart? Are you from the future? So no, uh, and the linter really you know, can, can do a great job there at hinting at, at issues as if you were uh, typing um, you know, uh, wrong stuff in, in Microsoft Word. Exactly the same mechanism of underlining um, the wrong stuff. There's some, well, I'm, I'm a fan of Visual Studio Code. I don't know what code editor you use. There's several like Atom, um, Sublime Text. I love Visual Studio Code. And there's several extensions that, that I use for uh, yeah, when I edit YAML file or, or when editing Open API specifications. Um, <coughs> Indent Rainbow is perhaps my favorite because it, it generates these graphic effects you can see on the left side, where you have all the different uh, colors appearing one after the other. And these colors help you understand at a glance if the indentation is right. So you don't have to guess. You don't have to like to count or use your fingers to understand if something is, is properly indented. Here's a list of useful websites. Um, I won't get too much into the details. Uh, these are all free tools, most of them. OpenAPI.tools is a fantastic directory of open source software you can use for uh, documentation. It's already is Tom Johnson's uh, fantastic course on API documentation. So now it's time for me to, to present the exercise. Um, I'll get to your questions in a minute. The exercise is, I'll, I'll send you the, uh, the slides in, in the Meetup chat later. So you have to improve an open API specification that I created that contains several errors and gaps. Um, and you have seven exercises here. You have to add content information. You have to add a security, uh, a security schema to a post operation. You have to define a, a schema for toppings. You have to add a delete operation. And there's several other things here. You also have to then um, check the specification invalid. You'll see that if you, if you click this link here, it will lead you to uh, a free code editor, which is what the Swagger editor. This is what you'll get is on the left side, you have the specification that I created. And you can type right here. And on the right side, you have a Swagger UI 
um, in, in the sidebar with the result with the resulting documentation. And this again is a free tool. So once you have done the exercises, you just have to go and save as YAML. And that will download your open API YAML file and you can send it send that to me uh, by email. Right. So um, this is the end of the presentation. Um, I'll start with the question now and uh, 